<coughs> okay, Boker Tov, Boker Tov, good morning. We're here Sunday morning again for some learning, for some Torah, for some uh, sharing of positive uh, stuff. And we always, of course, start with a bracha and the coffee that Hashem has blessed us, that God has blessed us. What would you do without coffee, huh? Okay, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Shehakol Niya Bidvaro. Okay, I heard the loud amen that you all answered. Beautiful, very impressed. You guys get a check for today. Okay, so today's class is uh, what in what is called the Ayin Hara in Yiddish. It's a lot of times we use the word Kenan Hara, which means that when you say something, you don't want someone's evil eye to affect you. Um, I every so often get a call from someone who says, Rabbi, everything I do is going wrong. Is there, I, I feel or I believe that someone placed an eye in her on me. Someone placed an even eye, eye on me. And everything is, is just whatever I touch is just not, it's just not working. It's just not working. So, um, <clears throat> so the question is, as posed by the title of the class, is it real? Does it exist? Or is it just a superstition? Do we have this concept? And if yes, are there, are there solutions? Are there suggestions? If no, then let's all have a good day and uh, move on. So, so let's talk about that a little bit. And the reason why we bring up this subject today is because in the portion of the Torah that we read just this past week, we actually um, had a... Uh, we had this issue. We had this issue in this week's Torah portion. Hold on a second. Let me see what this is. I don't know what that is. Okay. We had this issue in this week's Torah portion. And that is, uh, this past week, we read about um, the relationship that Sarah had with her maidservant, Hagar. And in that, <clears throat> we learn and we read that, um, that Sarah could not have children. She was Akara. She did not have any children. And she suggests to her husband, Abraham, the first Jew, our great-great-grandfather, that he should go ahead and um, <clears throat> and try to have a child with Hagar. Hagar was Sarah's maidservant. And uh, <clears throat> by the merit of her giving her Competition, sort of, to, uh, to Abraham, because as you could, as you might know, that biblically, biblically, there is no prohibition of a man having more than one wife, and we find that in the Bible, uh, where uh, people were married to more than one one woman. You had uh, Jacob was married to four women, four women. So she therefore suggests that in the merit that she will give her competition to Avram, God will have mercy on her, and she will also have a child. So the Torah tells us that as soon as she, uh, that Hagar, um, <clears throat> went ahead and, um, and got married to Avram, so immediately she became pregnant. She immediately became pregnant, and the Torah relates that Hagar there started to treat Vatekal Givirta Be'ineha, the Torah says. Her master became um, she became sort of dismissive of her mas master or mistress uh, or master. She became dismissive of her master, in this case, Sarah, and um, she went ahead and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, Sarah was very disappointed. And without going into the entire story and all the commentaries on the story, Sarah went ahead and um, she... The, the, the language that our sages tell us, she went ahead and she placed, or she, she directed an evil eye into Hagar, and she actually had a miscarriage, and only afterwards did she become pregnant again and gave birth to Yishmael. The sages learned this from the fact that the Torah later says, hara, you, the angel says to Hagar, you will become pregnant, even though the Torah already tells us before she's pregnant. So we learn from this, again, that, that which we have in, by tradition, the Medrash tells us already something that is a hinted to in the Torah, that Sarah caused Hagar's baby in the womb still 
to uh, to die or for Hagar to have a miscarriage. So here we seemingly see clearly that the concept of Ayin Hara, Kenan Hara, as the Yiddish is, as the word is somewhat uh, uh, distorted in, in as it's Yiddishized. So we see from this that that the concept of an Ayin Hara exists. We find this also um, a little bit later on. We find when Jacob, Jacob, our the third of the patriarchs, when he sends his sons to go to Egypt to go ahead and um, and bring food because there was a hunger, he says to them, do not all go in through the same gate because they were all so beautiful, so handsome, well built. They were, they were, they were, they they were, um, they, they had such sort of charisma and presence and so on. So Jacob says to them, I don't want you all to go in from one gate when you come to Egypt. You know, separate, spread out, go in from different gates. So that the evil eye should not affect you. The ein hara, ken ein hara, should not affect you. And <clears throat> and there are other examples which maybe we'll discuss, but. Also, the very fact that we're, that throughout history and generations, the term Kenain Hara, which is a Yiddish slash Hebrew word, to, to say the word correctly, it means Kain Ein Hara. Ein Hara is Hebrew, and Kain is Yiddish slash German. Kain Ein Hara means not to have an Ein Hara, to protect from an Ein Hara. And therefore, we keep on saying, often, especially if you're a little more nervous about these things, you saw say Kain Ein Hara, meaning, please, there should not be an evil eye. So what is this? What is this evil eye? What, what, what is this? How does this work? What what kind of what kind of what kind of power could somebody else have on and affect me? I mean, either I deserve to get what I get, or I don't deserve. What's well, you know what's going on over here? How does how does this function? And should I be concerned about it? Uh, is it superstition and so on? But I, I will right away say that obviously it's not superstition if we already if we find that it exists in the Torah. So if it does exist, what are the solutions? How does this work? So and also I always like to, when when possible, uh, bring in the uh, you know what the Rebbe's answer perhaps, the Rebbe Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneis and what his guidance on this issue was. So we might quote one or two uh, letters or responses from the Rebbe to this issue. So, <clears throat> so first I want to explain a little bit how this works. What's the concept? Now, I know there was uh, a lot of controversy over what was called the Peer Project in Princeton, I think in the 70s, where they did a, a study whether my mind, whether my mind can affect matter, mind over matter, where the mind, they had this whole study with coins and 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 the machine and whether if I wanted the coin there were heads or tails whatever the way I don't re I don't remember now all the details of the study but they came to a conclusion that my mind actually affects the matter can affect I mean there's something called kinetic energy but there's there's a lot of a lot of um, debate on that and I know that the Princeton study received a lot of criticism that it wasn't that it didn't really hold up to proper scientific standards again whether the mind can affect matter uh, you know you're, you're, you're sitting at the, you're sitting in at the, at the, at the game and uh, your batter uh, and now is the playoffs or, or soon to be World Series of, uh, of, uh, of baseball. You know, I'm a Brooklyn boy, I grew up with baseball, and you're sitting there, and before the pitcher pitches, and you want your guy to hit it out of the park, you 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 focus and you concentrate and you say, let the ball be hit out of the park, and boom, the guy hits it, it's out of the park. Or, you know, did your mind have any effect on that? But, and we have some sort of, we have a bit of a, a, of a sort of innate feeling that our mind can affect, you know, our positive thoughts. There's a famous statement of the Tzamech Tzedek, think positive and it will be positive. So, you know, what's going on over here and, and how is that possible? Is it correct? Is it not correct? So, so let's, 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 let's dissect that a little bit. L'chaim. So, you know, in 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 the Torah, especially in Kabbalistic teachings, there's there's something 
there's there's an energy from God that's referred to sometimes as midat hadin, and there is midat harachamim or chesed. Midat hadin means the attribute of, of of justice of severity. Midat harachamim is the attribute of mercy, chesed, or kindness. Right now, I'm putting them both together, although sometimes they're listed separately. Now, how does that? What does that mean? And to try to sort of simplify it, not to overcomplicate the concept, is that God created the world with two energies, amongst other energies. And the two energies, the point of these two energies was, on the one hand, you need to have justice, you need to have an element of accountability. If there's no accountability, then, <clears throat> then there's chaos. And besides that, uh, in addition, and perhaps even more importantly, someone you love, you hold accountable. You hold them accountable. So God introduced the attribute of din. Um, you know, someone else's child that misbehaves, you don't really pay attention. But if you sort of totally neglect and don't pay attention to your child who misbehaves, it's a form of, of, of abuse. You're not guiding your child. You're not giving them love by having din. On the other hand, God also in, uh, introduced into the world the midah of chesed or rachamim to allow a person to repent allow a person to correct their ways, to be ma'arich af. So God says, you know what, I'll have some patience, see if you correct your ways. So there's always a balance between sort of harsh, justice, exactness, severity, and, and compassion. And as in life, the balance is always where the difficulty lies to find the proper balance. Now, <clears throat> there is a concept and whether, I mean, a concept, it's more than just a concept, and, and, and that when we, when we go ahead and, we, and we're jealous of somebody else, or we, we cast a negative eye on someone else, that it could arouse the midat hadin on someone else. Meaning like this, that let's say somebody did something wrong. And who of us are innocent, right? Let's say we've sinned, we've 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 mistreated somebody, we've acted, uh, we've violated a mitzvah a commandment that God tells us to do. An avira, we've transgressed. Okay, so the midat harachamim, the midat of mercy, might say, you know what? It's a first a first offense. Uh, the temptation was too great. Uh, the person has a history of maybe repenting, etc., etc. Whatever, whatever the midat harachamim, the attribute of, of of kindness, of empathy, of, of of mercy, might argue to to extend extend the period of time before justice is exacted or responsibility is given, uh, uh, responsibility is taken for this person's behavior. But if you go ahead and you direct. Uh, the evil eye, uh, negativity, so then that person's um, attribute of justice can be hastened. And I'll explain why in a moment, okay? So this is not the full explanation. So it's not that the evil eye will all of a sudden bring something upon somebody else that they don't deserve. It might just sort of tip that balance of Rachman versus Din for something that you are responsible for. Now, usually how does this happen? So, so I want to I give an introduction, okay? Uh, a, again, a Torah concept. And with that, we'll appreciate. And, you know, sometimes I must say that I give the class and I get carried away with the discussion and sometimes forget to get back to a point or two that I mentioned earlier in the class. So if that happens, you are more than welcome, either during the class or after the class, to <coughs> post a message to say, Rabbi, you went ahead. You uh, mentioned this here, this uh, this uh, point, uh, or this question, or this idea, and you didn't get back to it. So, by all means, I know last week I began the class with showing a picture of my father-in-law of Hasidim. We spoke about wine and alcohol, and I never got back to it. So maybe I'll have time to get back to it today. We'll see. Okay. So, one of the blessings that Yaakov, that Jacob gives his and gives his son uh, Yosef's children Menashe and Ephraim he says that the angel who has redeemed me who has protected me and so on Amalach HaGoloti Yivarechet HaNarim should bless these boys in this case it was Menashe and Ephraim 
and he says, "Vikarevem Shmi Shem Avotai Avram Mitzvah Yaakov." And then he says, "Vayidgu Larov Beker of Haaretz," and they shall multiply tre- tremendously within the land. Beker of Haaretz. Now, the word over here used for multiply is "vayidgu." Vayidgu is the source. The root of the word "vayidgu" is from the word "dag." What does "dag" mean? A dog means a fish. The yidgula rov, the care of our it means that they shall be, they shall multiply like fish. And by the way, I I have to digress. I always like to say and give give credit to the one who some of the ideas of this class, not all, but some of the ideas of this class was is from. There's a very uh, entertaining and insightful lecturer in Israel called Rabbi Yitzchak Fagner. Uh, if uh, and and. Uh, some of the thoughts here, I heard a class from him, and it's really a great class. It's in Hebrew. Uh, with the, So we're, that's part of it, with some other ideas that we are uh, mixing and inserting over here. Okay, so we say, May they multiply like fish within the land. So what does that mean? Like, like what's the uniqueness of fish? Now, in the simple level is because, as we know, fish are the most fruitful uh, living creature in the world as in the ready in the six days of crea- creation when God blesses the fish he, ble- ble- he uses the term Yishritsu, he uses a term which indicates that fish because they are uh, before because they are uh, fished or, or, or uh, uh, used for food in such in such a, on such a mass scale God gave them a special blessing that they should uh, they, that they should multiply tremendously although yes we still have to be careful sometimes not to overfish etc not to to upset the sort of the ecosystem but having said that fish of course are uh, the most uh, abundant and fruitful of any living creature one fish can uh, can uh, can uh, I believe give off thousands of eggs and 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 have you know, throughout its lifetime uh, thousands of, of of offspring. So <clears throat> why over here specifically? So that's on the simple level. But why would be you know what would be missing if he didn't use the term beyid gularov that he says to the kindalach that they should be like fish? He could just say you should be fruitful and multiply tremendously. Why the comparison to fish? So here we come to uh, a discussion that the Gemara has, the Talmud has, and commentaries have, etc. That Yosef, Yosef, Jacob's son, had a special quality, and the Talmud uses the expression based on a story, the Loshalta Bo Ayin Hara, that the power of the Ayin Hara does not go ahead and affect and have any control over Yosef. Over Joseph Hatzadik, Joseph the righteous one, the descendant of the child of, of Yaakov. In fact, the Talmud tells us a story about uh, about Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan was one of the was the greatest of the sages of his time in the Talmud, and the Talmud discusses in detail how he was amazingly handsome. And uh, <clears throat> at some point, someone asked him in terms of he was doing something where where he allowed others in a positive mitzvah way, without getting to de- into details, to benefit from his handsomeness, in a, in a, in a, again, in a wholly productive way. And he was asked, are you not afraid of the ayin hara? Are you not afraid of kenayin hara? Are you not afraid of, of the evil eye? And he responded, Yosef. I am a descendant of Joseph Hatzadik, Yosef the Tzadik, the Lo Shalta Ba'in Hara, and the evil eye does not have any control over Yosef. Why? Why does the evil eye not have any control? And why does Jacob bless his grandchildren that they should be like fish in the water? So Shteit Kishrib so it says like this. It says that why was Yosef blessed? In fact, the Svardim, a lot of times, backing up for a moment, a lot of times they want to bless someone, they say, Ben Porat Yosef, Ben Porat Ole Ayin, or Ale Ayin. They bless you that you should be like Yosef, that you have Ale Ayin, that he's above the eye, that he goes ahead and nobody, and nobody could hurt him because with the evil eye. Why is it that Yosef HaTzadik, that Joseph the Tzadik merited that he should go ahead and 
um, be protected from the evil eye? The answer to that, we are told, is the following, that <clears throat> Yosef HaTzadik was extremely, uh, totally put his sort of uh, well-being and perhaps even life on the line as not to not to t- not to look and to covet and to want something that's not his. Where was that? Then we all know the famous famous story that the Bible that the Torah tells us in Parshat um, in Parshat uh, Vayeshev that that when Yosef was sold into slavery and he ended up at the home of Potiphar, who was one of the ministers of Pharaoh. And Potiphar had a beautiful wife, a gorgeous wife, that she went ahead and she um, she had this terrible, terrible crush on Yosef to the extent that she did whatever it takes to try to convince Yosef to lie with her, to lie with her in terms of having intimate relations, etc. And, um, and she is the boss and he is the slave and he refused all her pleading and threats and advances. I mean, the Midrash elaborates all the threats that she, that she, she, uh, she um, threatened him with. And Yosef, the Midrash says, didn't even raise his eye because he did not want to look, look in the, in the wrong way at something that was not his. And because Yosef went ahead and he was so loyal and fierce sort of to his convictions and not to look at something, and not to covet something that's not his, that's why he merited that he should be protected from the evil eye. And this was a blessing that was passed on to his kindalah. <clears throat> now regarding the fish, why are here kindalah blessed with fish? So the Gemara says, like to be like fish. So the Talmud says the following, and this is an answer, an answer to how one should protect themselves from the evil eye. The Talmud uses the expression, Ein ha-bracha shore el bedavar ha-samui min ha-ayin. Blessings is only, only rests on something which is covered from the eye. This is a take on the, it says in the, in the Bible, Vinasati bracha ba-asomecha. I don't know if I'm quoting it exactly right, but I will give blessings ba-asomecha, which literally means your, uh, your, um, your, uh, your storage, your grain storage, your your uh, silos, and so on. But the Talmud uses the word basamecha to also uh, use a play of words over here, and it is and it uh, and it darshans. It goes ahead and homiletically interprets this to mean also ein bracha shorel Bracha only rests on something which is covered from the eye, and this is the deeper meaning of you should be like fish. Why do fish multiply so much? Is because it's something you don't see. It's covered from the eye. It's underwater, you don't see it, and that's where the blessing rests. And therefore, <coughs> Yosef is blessed, uh, Yaakov, Jacob is blessing his grandchildren, but Yitgo, you should be like fish. Let me connect the dots over here, which means like this. And this is, this is a Jewish value. It's a human value, and especially a Jewish value. Something that in today's day and age of social media, we need to remember and take into account. The reason why someone else's evil eye can affect you, how could someone else affect you? It really could primarily affect you when when you're behaving in such a way that's uh, borderline ostentatious. When you're behaving in such a way, you know, you get this brand new car. And uh, you know this the latest model of I don't know Tesla. And you come to your friend's house and you beep and beep and say, You come, you gotta see my new car. Right. And your friend comes down and says, Oh, beautiful and fantastic. But inside is starting to turn with jealousy. So his jealousy, you know, the next day you wake up and someone keys your car. You know, takes a key and makes a beautiful design. The reason why this it can have this power is because the fact that you are acting in a way that arouses jealousy, that causes, as we said in the beginning of the class, the midat hadin, the attitude of justice, to say, you know what? You know, maybe there's something here. Let's look a little closer. You know, it's like if the IRS comes after you, 
uh, you know, how many of us, if they really look so very closely and they decide to find something, will will nobody wants nobody wants. Well, yeah, I hope everybody's uh, is 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 one hundred and ten percent kosher. But nevertheless, nobody likes to get an audit from the IRS, right? So, if you if you're acting in such a way that arouses that kind of either jealousy or attention, and so the other person's uh, sort of directing negative sort of energy through his thoughts causes maybe the causes the midat hadin, the attribute of justice to, to to start to re-examine what's going on over here. Meaning, meaning that it is the way to do some things in what we call the refined way. You know, you have people today. I'm saying social media. Every time you get this like something new, or you know, you, you move you 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 get you know you 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 have this need to show it off. Showing off is not a good thing. It's not a good thing. Ein habrachash shoreh, blessing only rests on that which is covered from the eye. Especially if it's out of the norm. If it's within the norm, if it's within the norm, you know, <coughs> there's, there's, a, a, there's a story, and I have limited time as usual. I have an unveiling this morning soon. Um, but, you know, the, 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 there's a story uh, story the, in the Tanakh in, in the prophets with uh, Hannah, the famous Hannah prophetess and mother of Samuel the prophet, and Elkanah. So over there we have a story, a deep story of jealousy. Hannah, Hannah uh, went ahead, and you know Elkanah, the the, the Torah, the the the, the, parash, the the Tanakh, the verse tells us that uh, that the Penina, Elkanah was married to Penina and to Hannah. Penina had multi, many children. And Hannah had, was childless, and she davened and she prayed to God that she should have children. And yet she would, her prayers were not answered. And Penina would taunt her, you know? Penina would take out her wallet to look at these pictures. Don't you like the way my, my, my children look? They're dressed so beautifully without, without um, being, being sensitive to the fact that Hannah didn't have any children. And the Talmud tells us, the Talmud gives us a stamp over here, a stamp of approval that Penina did this not because she wanted to hurt Hannah, but because she wanted Hannah in her jealousy to pray even harder to God so God should answer her, her prayers. That's what the Talmud tells us. And the result being is that eventually God did answer, answer Hannah and she had a child. But interestingly enough, when she asks God for a child, the Talmud in Brachot says, she said to God, I want a child that's not going to be overly tall or overly handsome. And so I want a child that, that, that just blends in, that fits in. Understand, my child, he's the best, he's the this. You're telling me my child did something wrong. Not my child, you know. Don't stand out. Don't. Ein habracha shora. Remember these words. Blessing does not rest. Ela bedavara samui minai. And something that is covered from the eye. I, I mean, I would also, I'll, also, I'll also tell you like this. And by the way, by the way, sadly, the Talmud tells us, the Midrash tells us that every time Hannah had a child, Panina lost two of her children because even though she had good intentions, but the fact that she caused such pain to Hannah, one of God's children, no parent wants when you cause pain to another of their child, she was punished for that. Panina was punished for that. So, <clears throat> the, 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 um, <clears throat> Where was I going with this? I had another thought, another thing. I'm looking at my sheets over here, but it's my mind went blank. Okay, so there, there, there is sort of more discussion that we can have on this, but I want to I want to conclude with the following, maybe two or three points. One point is the Talmud says that if somebody is concerned with ayin hara, with ayin hara, with a bad eye, they somehow they feel somebody placed a bad eye, things are not going 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 good for them the Talmud says the following a person should say the following sort of cantation or incantation am I pronouncing it correctly um, that the person should say the fo following statement um, in Hebrew it's like this Ani mezar o shel Yosef de lo shalta bo ayin bishor ayin hara they should say the following statement I am from the Descendants of Yosef, because all Jews are sometimes referred to as the children of Yosef, that an ayin hara cannot have any effect. 
So that's one suggestion. And by the way, another suggestion is, you know, by the Sephardic, our Sephardic brethren, they talk about the Chamsas, they hang up a Chamsa. <coughs> Chamsa is five. Why five? Because again, Ayin, the numerical word for the Ayin, if you add up Ayin, is 130. Ayin, Ayin is the letter Ayin is 70, Yud is 10, Nun is 50. Together, that's 130. God's name, God's name, the attribute of, of, of chesed, of kindness, which is the Yud, the He, Vav, and He, is 26. 26 times 30 is 100, sorry, sorry, 26 times 5, 5, Chamsa. Chamsa means something of 5. So we raise our right hand, 5, 5 times 26, God's name, because in, in Kabbalah, and Kabbalistic teachings, we have the concept of 5, that is mamtik, that five, five brings sweetness to the attribute of gvurav, of justice, which is divided into five. So we have the five um, times of God's name together, that's uh, 130, which brings about a good eye. So just a, a side point. But I want to say like this, the Talmud also uses this expression. This is very important because some people become like totally mashuga about this. You know, they they become they become so so uh, neurotic, and they become so uh, uh, fearful of any kind of uh, to, to the extent that it is superstition. So, <clears throat> a couple of things. One thing is, I, I want to read here a letter of the Rebbe. The Rebbe says like this. So the Rebbe over here says, I want I want to read this letter over here from the Rebbe, and I will translate. Okay, so the Rebbe says like this. Um, someone wrote to the Rebbe a concern, Rabbi Nachman Lashle, a concern about Ayn Haras. So and the Rebbe responds like this: If your mezuzahs are kosher, and you f you go ahead and you conduct yourself daily in the way of Torah and mitzvot, you cannot be affected by the evil evil eye because Torah, in the Bible, God says v'chai behem that Torah and mitzvot brings you life. And therefore, if you're going to fulfill the mitzvahs in a meticulous manner, you don't have to worry about Ayin Hara. Point number one. Point number two. And this is also an answer from Rav Moshe Feinstein. Ayin Hara is only something you have to be concerned about if you do something out of the norm of life. You got a new car because you got a new car, right? It's the norm of life. You need a car. That's not an Ayin Hara. But if you get, you decide, I need a car. But what kind of car do I have to buy? I must buy a car that's going to make all my neighbors jealous. You know, you want to poke them in the eye. Then you do have to be concerned about a nine hara. That's point number two. Point number three, and this was the most common answer that the Rebbe would give to people when they asked whether you're concerned about ein hara, is based on also on a statement of our sages, which says, man de kopid, man de lay kopid, man de kopid kabdinan lay. One who is very concerned and is always worried about the evil eye or similar, then in return he will draw down that negative energy upon him. So if in, in many times where people would write to the Rebbe about the evil eye, the Rebbe would say, Tasiach daito, or Tasiach daito, just pay no attention. The very fact that you're not going to pay attention will remove its power. So what's the final conclusion of this class in terms of practicality? Does Ayin Hara exist? It exists. As the Talmud and Torah tell us it exists. So we can't dismiss that. Torah, God's wisdom, it's true. Whether we understand, whether we know, we, 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 we know how it works, it exists. We also explained a bit how it works. But we gave you several solutions. Number one, do not poke out someone else's eyes. Blessing, blessing is drawn down on something which is Shah still, don't don't be ostentatious, don't don't do something, don't talk. you could even bring by the way an Ayn on yourself. It's if someone who goes ahead and brags about themselves, also could bring about an Ayn on themselves. Don't go around bragging about yourself. Edel, quiet, refined. You know? There's no need. I know we live in a time that everybody has to tout their own compliments, your self-esteem. The Torah says, you know, a little a little more refined, a little more you know, and that's what draws down the blessing. And then if you're still very concerned because maybe you're having just like a really bad streak, there are things that can be done, the Torah tells us, I mean, there are things that can be done first and foremost to just 
dismiss it. But if you really want to do something, you could say what I mentioned before. Anam is that a Yosef Atzadik. I'm a descendant of Yosef that the Ein Hara doesn't affect. Ben Porat Yosef, Ben Porat Ala Ayin. You could write that down, and uh, and you could use that as a, as a as a saying to protect you of the Ein Hara. There's also something that uh, that uh, there's a there's a some sort of custom about about uh, <clears throat> the red string, which I'm not sure what the source of that is, but I know there's something about a blue, and the reason for blue is because blue reminds us of heaven, which in turn reminds us of God Almighty, which means that when you are concerned about the Ein Hara, focus more and more that Hashem is in control of everything, and therefore don't worry about someone else's evil eye. So that is <clears throat> our short class over here about Ein Hara. We hope that... Uh, Hashem, uh, but, oh, I, I, this is something very important, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I remembered this. One of the other <clears throat> uh, strong recommendations of how to protect yourself from an eye hara is to is actually to train yourself to look at someone else with a good eye, what, to really work on that. When you see someone else is blessed, to be happy for them, and to send good energy, to be happy and positive, and look with a good eye. As 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 Shlomo Melech says, Tov Ayin Hu Yivarach. Someone with a good eye will be blessed. So one of the most powerful ways to protect yourself from a bad eye is by training yourself <clears throat> not to be jealous of others and look at others with a good eye. So may you be blessed. It's not easy always because we're human. We have our weaknesses. May you be blessed in the power of this Torah class to be able to rise up to that place, to be able to overcome and remove and block out and push away any jealousies, but on the other hand, be happy for what someone else has and send them only blessing. And in turn, in turn, not only for that reason, but in turn, you will be blessed that you will be protected from any evil eye. But you have a great week, a fantastic week. This week we're, we're doing our food distribution on Wednesday. Any help would be uh, much appreciated. Thank you.